is back again. Game two of the Timberwolves Grizzlies series, and there's no better place to give you all the coverage that you need leading up to the game than Locked on Grizzlies. My name is Sean Coleman, and as always with me is my co-host from the Commercial Appeal, DeMichael Cole. DeMichael, how are you this afternoon, sir, or excuse me, this morning? I'm great, Sean. I, I, I'm great. You know, it's playoff time. It's playoff basketball. I've been keeping up with all these games, and it's been some good basketball. And, you know, I'm enjoying it. Now, you know, this series that we get to cover is, is probably right along with the Celtics and Nets in the East, probably the most fun one in the West. Absolutely. Two teams that are, are very similar. But, you know, we talk about resiliency. We talk about bouncing back. We talk about a Grizzlies team that is purely motivated. Like, I'm not saying they weren't motivated for game one, but now they 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 should be. They have every reason to be. They They need to be focus, which is not something they have an issue with, but we talk about resiliency, we talk about bouncing back, we talk about facing adversity. This team has shined every single time it's been faced with that all year long, and we're looking forward to seeing it. My name is Sean Coleman. You can find me at StatsSAC on Twitter, covering the team now for my second year as a member of the media, media been hosting Locked and Grizzlies now for two years. My co-host, Michael Cole, beat writer for the Commercial Appeal. You can find my work over at Grizzly Bear Blues. In other words, wherever you go to find Grizzlies coverage, it's likely me and DeMichael are going to be right there. As a part of like it. Here, baby. Exactly. And, of course, we're here together at Locked on Grizzlies. But so it's been a fun few days, DeMichael. And, you know, we've talked, you know, about, you know, Jaws' presence on social media. I know Kendrick Perkins of ESPN was ranking uh, Anthony Edwards and John Morant, and he ranked Anthony Edwards over John Morant, I believe, when it came to social media, which didn't make a lick of sense to me. But Ja certainly has been the topic of conversation today, a a very um, significant picture, cryptic picture, if you will, of Michael Jordan holding a baseball bat from the last dance. And we're sad to report that John Morant is going to announce his retirement to pursue a career with the Atlanta Braves after – Game two. I'm just kidding. No, I'm joking to side. So I, I usually don't sit here and talk that much about Instagram and t- Twitter and all that different stuff. But to Michael, you know, this is significant. This is yeah. Jaws version. We always saw Mike Conley talked about being locked in on Twitter. This is Jaws version. And it was pretty fun to see the reaction. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, Sean. For one, I'm a big fan of The Last Dance. And and while we're, while we're talking Braves here, uh, John Morant, right now, Braves could use a, you know, a speedy outfielder. Uh, we could we could use them out there in center field, you know, to hop hop those fences and chase shag some of those balls. But but yeah, uh, with the last dance, and and it was funny the clip that he picked out. I mean, it couldn't have been much more perfect for this situation, you know. You, you the first part of the clip, you know, my, Michael Jordan is asked, you know, basically, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't know the exact words, but he's asked, you know, you. You, you just lost the game. You know, aren't, aren't you worried? He's like, no, it's just one game. You know, it's a series. And John Morant basically repeated that message when he spoke with the media yesterday. Said, if we're down 1-0, it's, it's best of seven. Like, who, you know, it's no big deal. We still have time. And then the other part of that message, you know, this is where Michael Jordan, you, you know, that psychological side that people talked about, you know, with him came in. And it, it's, it's interesting to see John Morant tap into, you know, that in a way. Because over the course of his career, he's going to need it because he everyone's going to fill his head up with good stuff. He's going to need, you know, to find that motivation. But um, getting back to the point here, uh, Michael Jordan was saying, like, well, it's easy to talk trash talk, you know, when you're winning. Anyone can talk trash when you're winning. Right, Sean? You're winning the game. Yeah, you can you can yap your mouth because, you know, they can't say anything. But the real trash talkers, they're talking when the game is tied. They're talking when the game when they're playing from behind and they're saying no we're not worried we'll catch up and all of that stuff uh he he didn't cut the clip he could have cut the clip short now John Morant played that clip in there and and to me I feel like that was his way of he knows you know he has a presence on social media like you just mentioned he saw after that game I think it was D'Angelo Russell and Pat Beverly I know it's Pat Beverly and the teammate uh, when they, you know, were walking off the court, did the little dance moves off the court. I, I don't know what else they were saying during the game, but it did look like too much was going on during that game. But that trash talk portion was put in there, too. So I think that was interesting as well. But I, I like it, Sean. It, you know, it adds a little fire to the series. 
It absolutely does. And the thing about it is, you know, that this is what's so fun about this series. You know, we talk about Anthony Edwards, and I'm already tired of talking about Anthony Edwards, but I He's mean good, that's right. the most good. compliment. But that's the thing that stood out to me. I, I mean, I was going to put that on Twitter today, but, you know, one thing that has always stood out to me about John Moran over the past three years to Michael is that you don't usually see a player as young as John Morant be universally, you know, loved, you know, it, it supported, you know, liked like his peers do. Uh, you don't usually see that. There's not a lot of polarization when it comes to Ja Morant. He typically is very highly thought of by peers, by fans, and things like that. Anthony Edwards is on that same trajectory. So that's the thing that stands out to me. You've got two of the most beloved young players who media loves, the game loves, their peers love. You've got two young players facing in the playoff matchup that could be the first of many battles over the years. That's what's so exciting about this. Anthony Edwards got the first laugh. John Morant looks like he's lined up to have the last laugh, though. So, I mean, just going back to the players, you know, uh, they're, they're easy to like. You know, when you think about the 21st century, 2022 NBA basketball, they have everything that, that we as fans of the game love. They're both high flyers, excitement, um, thrilling scorers. Uh, they both, you know, came into the league and, and, you know, made their mark as soon as they entered the league. And they both themselves really well in the media. They're both good for, you know, those good sound bites. They're both very authentic. And when they talk, you know, I'm looking at the other day when when John Morant was asked uh, about how how they're going to approach this series from a trash talking perspective. And, and, and I think I asked them something like, um, you know, have you had a conversation with your teammates about, you know, keeping your cool? And he basically was like, you, you know, that was me. He said, you remember that quote? We, 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 we're running up the chimney. They're not ducking no smoke, you know, and, and he then he goes on to say. There's no conversation to be had. That's a soft person's tendency. How many players are going to give a quote like that, Sean? That's 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 that authenticity. And then you talk about uh same thing with Anthony Edwards after the game. You know, he gets asked about the Memphis fans, and he's talking about the kids. And they're, they're both just real easy to gravitate to. But like you said, John Morant is lined up to get the uh, next laugh. There's going to be a lot of attention put on Anthony Edwards in this game. I think Dylan Brooks will get the start on him. They're going to be really physical with him. And they're going to do everything in their power to prevent him from getting comfortable enough to where he can take over, you know, over the course of the game, the way he did in that last game. Whereas John Morant, he talked about how they blitzed him, you know, and his, you, you could really tell this was one of the most informative and it was only five minutes. Shines. This was one of the more informative shoot arounds uh, conversations I've seen us have with John Morant. And, and one of the things he talked about was how they blitzed him and he, and he talked about how, you know, oh, that's something I've seen all season and how he can prepare for it. And you can really tell that he dived into the film. And he's poised for it, huh? He knows what he has to do. Now it's as simple as making the right decisions and making those shots as well. That was going to be my exact point. You read my mind on that. Stop <laughs> doing that, all joking aside. But you read my mind on that. You know that, you know, John Moran and Anthony Edwards, the other thing that they're so likable about them is they're always good for a good interview or a good quote. But I know that we talk about Instagram, we talk about the trash talk, all that different stuff, all that's fun. But I did think that it was really insightful from John Morant to talk about making that right pass. You know, it's not just yeah. settling for the good shot, it's settling for the best shot every single time. And I think the Grizzlies are going to have to really focus on that three-point shot. And John Morant was talking about how it falls on him to really make that extra pass to set up his teammates. I think that that's going to have to be a big part of this game because if they start shooting the threes early to Michael, they kill two from one stone. They get off to that hot start, which we know they need to do, and they get in that early rhythm to hit threes, which we also know they need to do. Exactly. Exactly. Two birds, one stone. So you, you said it the perfect way. Uh, I'm not expecting the Grizzlies to come out in this game the same way that they did in game one. Nothing, nothing close to it. I think this is the game. Sean, they can't, gonna, they, 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 they can't afford to. You're absolutely right. Right. But this is the game where we're really going to learn. You know, I talk a lot about Taylor Jenkins' mind because I love to get into it. You know, how he handles rotations, how he does the first half subs in comparison to the second half subs. Um, what type of, you know, analytical things he talks about in his, you know, talks with us just to see what he emphasizes the most. I really like to try to get inside of his head. And the next thing for him 
is going to be the adjustments, you know, because here's the thing. Not only is he going to have to adjust to the mistakes that the Grizzlies made and, and, the, and the things that they want to correct. For example, um, Stephen Adams, you know, after the game with Stephen Adams, we talked about how he struggled. Only three rebounds, lowest rebound in total since November 28th. A big part of that was Minnesota crowded him with bodies. Taylor Jenkins talked about that. He noticed that. Well, look at it like this. Steph Curry, for example. Everyone talks about how he cr creates so much gravity on offense. And all that is saying is with Steph Curry, he can run in circles and eyeballs will find him just because they say 30 is over there. Steven Adams, from a rebounding perspective, the Timberwolves approached it as there he is, you know, put eyeballs on him, make sure he's not getting the board, surround him with bodies. Now the Grizzlies have a chance to adjust to that. If they're going to put multiple bodies on Steven Adams, you have other guys who are capable of crashing those boards and creating opportunities for your team as well. They have to take advantage of that. Taylor Jenkins has chances to make adjustments there, and he's also going to have to adjust to the Timberwolves' adjustment. Chris, Chris Finch is not going to just come out and, you know, oh, we won. Let's run it back. Let's play the same exact way. No, no coach does that. They, they're going to find kinks in their game too where they struggled and they're going to try to correct those, and he's going to have to beat them to the punch on those things. So this is the game. Game one, fill-out game. You know, you're playing, and you you just have regular season stuff to go off of. Game two, you have a game under your belt. Let's see what he does differently. This is where we, we get a good look at the makeup of Taylor Jenkins as a playoff coach. Absolutely. At the end of the day, you know, the great thing to do would be not to let Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony yeah. Edwards go <laughs> 10 for 15 in the first quarter. But we're going to talk a bit more about some thresholds. I talked about a bit of it over the weekend. We're going to talk about some fun thresholds that if the Grizzlies hit, it typically follows true that they're putting themselves in a good position to win. We'll discuss that in just a moment. But before we do want to talk with you a bit about prize picks, listen, we talk about how Steven Adams, it's rare that he doesn't get a lot of rebounds, especially a lot of offensive rebounds. But just imagine if you could profit off choosing Steven Adams to get Five offensive rebounds in a game. Well, that's exactly what you can do through prize picks. You pick two to five players and an over-under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times an entry, and it's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. For a limited time, prize picks has an exclusive no-brainer of an offer for all of its users. You can get the users get $50 for free. If a player in their first prize picks entry scores a single point, but you must use code NBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer available to locked on fans. Sign up today and use code NBA $50 for free if the player in your first prize pick entry scores a single point. Now, let's talk about another thing that stands out to me, to Michael, and that's betonline.net. You know, I'd be willing to bet, you know, legitimately. The Grizzlies are going to have a very first first quarter in this game against the Timberwolves. What would you be willing to bet on that? I'd be willing to bet a lot on it, Sean. I mean, that first quarter, the last first quarter was very unorthodox to them. They're gonna they're gonna pick it up. They're gonna come out fast. They're gonna have a big first quarter, Sean. I'd be willing to bet on it. And it's not just the offense; it's the defense as well. But something I can tell you easily is you could feel like you're shooting you're making 100 from three when you use betterline.net the fastest and easiest way for you to bet online when it comes to your betting wagering on sports you've got baseball playoff basketball obviously boxing usc even vegas casino games check out betterline.net today the fastest and easiest way for you to bet on all your sports action when it comes to wagering and betting on sports. Listen, we can't thank you enough for joining me and DeMichael previewing game two. We're going to be talking about all Grizzlies, all Timberwolves, all week long here, making your first listen, Locked on Grizzlies. But make sure you check out the Locked on NBA podcast as your second listen of the day with all great playoffs action going along. So, DeMichael, I, I wrote a piece over at, at Grizzly Bear Blues. Now, I'm never going to sit here and it didn't say that I'm as good as writer as you are. You're fantastic. No, I don't do it. Uh, You're just but absolutely fantastic. Great. I don't compliment you much, so don't expect for it to happen <laughs> again. But all joking aside, I, I, I enjoy playoff time because, you know, I love stats and numbers and, you know, just, you know, different things that the Grizzlies do on a regular basis that allows for them to win. But something that st stood out to me, my favorite stat over that I did – over at Grizzly Bear Blues is, is we talk about getting off to a hot start. And, and I wrote in, in, in the piece that the Grizzlies, in 48 games this year, 
they scored 30 or more points in the first quarter. And when they did that, when they did that, 37 and 11 this year. So their offensive ability in the first quarter is what was really stood out, which has really helped them get into rhythm, set tones, things like that. But another very underrated part of this Grizzlies team is how good they've been defensively in the first quarter this year. I don't have those numbers in front of me as of yet, but that's what stands out. This Grizzlies team cannot afford to allow for Carl Anthony Towns and, and Anthony Edwards to be the only ones getting in rhythm on the court. I talk about getting off to that hot start offensively matters, but to Michael tonight, the Grizzlies defense early on is what's really going to have to matter for them to win that first quarter like they need to. Yeah, it, and the way they play, the defense channels the offense. Defense turns into offense because when you like to get out in transition the way the Grizzlies do, the easiest way to get out in transition is grabbing the ball off the rim and going. And that's why, you know, I think about that game uh, recently against it was the Jazz or the Nuggets. It was the Nuggets game. The, the game they lost, the last game of the last road trip uh, against the Denver Nuggets. The players basically said, look, we we couldn't play our brand of basketball because we kept taking the ball out of the net. That slowed us now. We couldn't get out. And they had zero fast break points in the first half. You just don't see that happening with this team a lot. So going back to the point, yeah, you're right, Sean. And the thing is, game one against the Timberwolves, you you blinked and it was nine to two, and Taylor Jenkins was calling a timeout. And next thing you know, they had forty one points. You know, and I mean, it it happened fast, and, and and they were going. And again, when they're taking the ball out the net, they're not as effective. You know, this isn't a, a, a great half court team. You know, uh, they know their strengths. They play to their strengths, and defense turns to offense. And they're able to really make plays, you know, and it's not just John Morant grabbing the rebound. It's whoever grabs it, they're pushing it and they're gone. And that starts with the defense. You're, you're 100 percent right. Uh, if they're able to hold the Timberwolves below 50 percent shooting in that first quarter, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that they're going to be in the lead. And it's going to be, you know, 30 plus point quarter like we've seen so many times. Absolutely. And that, you know, the, getting off to the good start, especially defensively in that first quarter, is 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 my main number one takeaway mm. from game one. But obviously the other thing that talked about, we were just talking about with John Moran. You mentioned it to Desmond Bain. He said we have to shoot more threes. Listen, the Grizzlies, that's the other thing that they need to do. They need to shoot threes. Here are some fun numbers for you when it comes to the Grizzlies shooting threes. The Grizzlies were 7-27 to in that game, in the first, in the first game uh, of the playoffs. 26% from three. The thing that stands out is, is that the Grizzlies in 40 games this year shot 35% or more from three. So literally every other game, they were shooting 35% or better from three. 35 and five in those games. But here's an even more important stat to me. Before the All-Star break, they played 60 games. In 25 of those 60 games, they hit 35% or more of their threes. In 15 of their 22 post-All-Star break games, they hit 35% from three a lot more frequently and were 13 and two in those games. The outlier for the Grizzlies is not the seven threes or is the seven threes and the 26% from three. This team regularly hit double digit threes and hit 35% or better from three. 12.6 threes per game in their last 30 games of the year, 38% from three. But here is the my favorite stat of all those that I mentioned to Michael. In 68 games this year, the Grizzlies had either, the Grizzlies were better than th within three threes of the opponent. There were 68 games this year where the Grizzlies opponent had three or more threes than the Grizzlies, or the Grizzlies were better than that, if that makes sense. The net differential was the opposing team had three or less threes or better for the Grizzlies case, and the Grizzlies were 47 and 11. In other words, getting back to the point that we've made, the Grizzlies just simply, they don't need to outshoot the Wolves, but they need to make sure they don't get dominated from three once again. And if they can get it going early, that rhythm will help them be able to do that. If the Grizzlies can keep the three-point differential close, they have a very good chance of winning this game. Yeah, yeah. And and, and locked on, Grizz fans, I, I'm, I'm going to say something similar to what Sean just said. But I'm going to simplify it in a way of that's the stats, man, right there. 
I'm just going to do some simple math over here. This is the simple math man over here in the Michael. They made 16 threes, the Timberwolves, right? 16 threes, the Grizzlies made seven. That's 48 points. That's 21 points. That's a 27-point difference. How you like that, Sean? 27-point difference from the three-point line. <laughs> who, who does simple math anymore? Good God. Yeah, I know. Net, now I, I need to take out net differential. I confuse my own self there. But you make a great point. Go ahead. And that's a that's a 27 point difference from the three point line. And it goes back to exactly what Sean just said. If the Grizzlies can just close that gap, you know, if they if the Timberwolves make 15 threes in this game and the Grizzlies make, you know, 12, that's a nine point. That's a nine point difference. They'll cover that with their points in the paint and the way that they score on the inside. They, I mean, they're going to win pretty much the points in the paint battle in almost every game that they play in this series. So, yeah, just exactly what Sean said. They have to be able to minimize the damage there. And it's going to be, you know, from Dylan Brooks, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson is going to have to shoot well. And I have a feeling that the bench is going to get shorter, you know, over the course of this series. So we might not see those guys as much. But even when they come in, De'Anthony Melton only played 14 minutes in that last game. He had been playing, you know, upwards of 20, you know, throughout that last stretch of the season. Only 14 minutes in game one. I think maybe that played a part in him just not being in that. You know, he's a rhythm player. We've talked about that a lot. Being in that same rhythm that he's been in. Uh, Desmond Bain and Dylan Brooks made six of the seven threes in game one. Tyus Jones made the other one. Tyus Jones is good for a three-pointer, you know, in these games. So, But at the end of the day, it's those starters. It's Jaron Jackson. He's going to have to be consistent. Dylan Brooks. I, I never thought I'd have to say this, Sean, but if Dylan Brooks goes three for four from three-point range, he should be shooting more of them because he started off three for three. If, and, it, and I saw the stat sheet going into the fourth quarter, and I said, Dylan Brooks is three for three from three-point range, and he hasn't felt like he needed to throw up a heat check yet? That surprised me. But, yeah, uh, they're going to have to even that out just a little bit more. They don't have to take 41 threes. That's not their game. That's not who they are. They're going to get the ball in the paint. They're going to create easier scoring opportunities that way. And you look, I'd take easy two-point opportunities over contested three-point opportunities any day of the week. Create those easy opportunities. And then make some three pointers. I'd say the magic number for three pointers for me, Sean, it's I say ten or eleven. You know, you 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 know the stats of where they make ten or more threes, but I say eleven is where where they should be. Ten or eleven threes, and I mean they'll win. It's that simple. Absolutely, thirty five and eight this year when they had twenty five or more threes and ten or, or twenty five plus assists and ten or more threes. But the other big thing that I'll say is this: is that to your point. You know, something that I had mentioned, something we talked about is as many times as possible, the Grizzlies need to find the best available shot. One thing that I did like from the first game, Jaron, Desmond, Dillon, 17 combined three-point attempts. That's perfectly fine. That's enough from them. Jaron hitting a few of them would be great. When he has two blocks and two threes this year, Grizzlies are 19-8 when he's getting that activity. Him being in the game would be great. But we cannot give up on DeAnthony Melton. We cannot give up on his shooting. We absolutely cannot. We'll talk about it in a minute. Two big things the Grizzlies cannot do. They cannot give up on Stephen Adams, and they cannot give up on DeAnthony Melton. The positives right now still outweigh the negatives, in my opinion. Forgive me. I just wanted to say that. But the whole point <laughs> is getting that rhythm going early, I think, is going to be a huge, huge key. Speaking of rhythm, I don't know about you, DeMichael, but one thing that I do is – you know. A rhythm is how I know that my car is running well. When my car, it just says, when it just is, it is purring, when I start it up, that rhythm lets me know that it's working. But if I don't hear that rhythm, it likely means I need new car parts. And so I, I know, DeMichael, that you you know have experienced that before, but have you ever checked out rockauto.com? rockauto.com, uh, son. That's where I go. Um, and, and, and they're cheaper parts. And, and you know, you, you go to all these, these stores and, and they don't have everything. John. They, they just don't. They don't have everything for these newer model cars, for these older model cars, and not at the same affordable prices that you can get them with rockauto.com. But the whole point is, regardless of make and model, regardless of the part that you need, you're going to find it at rockauto.com. Also, it's a very friendly family-owned business. They know that car parts typically fall out of budget. So they're going to try their best to make sure that car parts are expensive as or not as expensive as they can be, 
but as cost effective as they can be. When we visit rockauto.com, let them know the Locked On Podcast Network sent you. Rockauto.com, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the car parts you'll ever need. Visit rockauto.com today. We can't thank you enough, obviously, for checking out Locked On Grizzlies on tomorrow's episode. Listen, it's going to be all the reaction to game two, and we're about to break down game two for you right now. So, DeMichael, I put out on Twitter, looked at some of the matchup-based stats that we talked about for Monday's episode. And one thing that certainly sticked out to me was we talked about it before this series started. Who should guard who? Should Dylan be on, you know, uh, uh, should Dylan be on D'Angelo Russell or should he be on um, Anthony Edwards? And and it started off, as you said, he was on D'Angelo Russell, switched on to Anthony Edwards. And to your point, he did a great job on D'Angelo Russell. But the thing that sticks out to me was obviously, we know, 12 of 16. That's what the T-Wolves were versus Steven Adams. The thing that also stands out, though, is that D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards were 6 of 18 versus Desmond Bain and Dylan Brooks as primary defenders. My whole point that I'm getting at, here, here's, here's what I'm thinking, and then I want to get your thoughts. Des on D'Angelo, Dylan on Ant, Adams on Vanderbilt if he starts. Put him on Jalen McDaniel, Jaden McDaniel, so Jaden McDaniel starts. Trip. On Carl Anthony Towns, I know that you're running the risk, but do it. And then John Beverly. That's how I would line it up. What are your thoughts? I love it, son. You, you, you I love it. Now, <sighs> this is, but this would be my one, my one change. I would start Stephen Adams on Carl Anthony Towns. I, I would start it that way. And 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 you know Taylor Jenkins again going into his mind. I think you start it there, and you and you play some different defensive coverages. See what you get. You know, you, you you just make it where you like if they screen Steven Adams, you probably hedge or you trap or you blitz or something like that. Just don't leave him on an island, you know, in those situations. And because you can blitz with Steven Adams as long as you have Jaron Jackson uh on the on the back line there. So I think you you know you still started there so you can get his rebounding. But of course, at the end of the game, no doubt about it, it's gonna be Jaron Jackson, Brandon Clark in that matchup. All day because I think I mean Jaron Jackson Jr. is just too valuable. He 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 had seven blocks in 24 minutes, uh, 24 minutes, seven blocks. They need him on the floor as much as possible. And I mean, Carl Anthony Towns is aggressive. He he takes that ball off the dribble. And if Jaron Jackson Jr. takes one false step, he's gonna draw the foul and boom. Now now you're sending him to the bench. And now you have to play Stephen Adams on him. So uh, I would I would start Stephen Adams on Carl Anthony Towns. But if you say over the course of the game who plays on him more, I think it's going to be Jaron Jackson. So that's that's my take. So I kind of I agree with you, but in terms of just starting at the beginning, I think you say hey Stephen Adams, stay on him. But the other matchups we're on the same page. Uh, Anthony Edwards, I you know I, I said that. Dylan Brooks, you know, should start on D'Angelo Russell in, in that last game. And he did, and he did what he was supposed to do against D'Angelo Russell. But you can't let Anthony Edwards get hot like that again. I don't care. I mean, we saw in that third quarter, they switched Dylan Brooks onto him. And in my mind, even at that point, Sean, I was shaking my head. I said, it's too late. It's Dylan Brooks is not about to just, I mean, this is an NBA elite scorer. It, that, that hand up, he doesn't see it. He <laughs> He doesn't see it at that point. He was already cooking. And I think he had 19 points in the first half and he had 17 in the second. It, it just didn't change much. So with that being said, you start Dylan Brooks on him. He doesn't even have a chance to get into that rhythm. He doesn't have a chance to, to for the basket to turn into an ocean and, and, you know, for it to look as big as it did for him throughout the course of that game. And you take him out of the rhythm. So I'm with you on all the matchups. I think at the end of the day, at the end of the game, um, you're going to have, you know, uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. to go against Cat, and it's it's going to be a fun battle. You're going to have Brandon Clark to use throughout the game, but I think the main thing with Jaron Jackson Jr. is you want to get him through those third and fourth quarters without having to send him to the bench for an early whistle. Exactly, and that's another thing that's going to stand out as well. You know, I think there were three or four whistles, and and let's be honest, the rest were far from perfect, Um, you know, in the the first game. You're going to see that happen in these games. That's just the way it's going to be. The Grizzlies, especially Dylan and Jaron, they're going to have to eliminate any chance uh, of just, you know, cheap fouls early on, because fouls are going to be at a premium. But I agree with you. If we could put Dylan on 
car are on Ant, and he can use that physical style against him, it really, really can help out. But the other thing that I'll say is this in tonight's game is that, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, Corinth, or excuse me, um, uh, Dan, or Danthony Melton only had three field goal attempts, I believe, in the game. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. I get that maybe you were going with your starters a bit more. And I think the Grizzlies should probably play their starters a bit more in this game. But I do not think that we should shy away from giving DeAnthony Melton chances. We talk about wanting to prioritize the three. Give one of your best shooters the chance to go. Because a DeAnthony Melton hot streak, a DeAnthony Melton <laughs> surge, absolutely could be the difference in a loss and a win. It absolutely could be. You want that three-point differential that we keep preaching, we keep harping on to be in the Grizzlies' favor, to be closer? DeAnthony Melton is one of the biggest avenues for you to take to be able to get to that. So another big thing for me, keep prioritizing DeAnthony Melton. Let him get in a rhythm. Let him cook and see where it can lead you. That's that's their Malik Beasley. We saw Malik Beasley in game one. 23 points, came out shooting. And the thing about Malik Beasley is he's not going to stop shooting. He's going to keep shooting. He's going to keep shooting. He's going to make some. And, I mean, this is what he do. This is a top 10 guy in three-pointers made in the NBA. The Grizzlies have their Malik Beasley. Not quite, you know, the full season of, of work, but De'Anthony Melton, you mentioned those second-half three-point numbers for the Grizzlies, uh, how the team has shot so well. You know why? The easiest person to point that to is De'Anthony Melton. Desmond Bain was Desmond Bain in the first half. Uh, Tyus Jones shot the ball really well all season long as well, just didn't take the type of volume shots that he started to take more in the second half. Well, Anthony Melton, when he went on that toward hot streak that started in Houston in early March, and he took off, and he's that guy. But, you know, it's tough, Sean, because you you, you look at the lineup and you say, oh, you bring Anthony Melton in. Well, are you going to take out Desmond Bain? I don't want to take out Desmond Bain. Are you going to take out Dylan Brooks? You don't want to take Dylan Brooks off the floor that much, especially if Anthony Edwards is playing 42 minutes. You want him matched up on Anthony Edwards as much as you possibly can. And then it's like, okay, well, um, John Morant, you, 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 you don't want to take John Morant out. And, of course, we've talked about the importance of Jaron Jackson Jr. Your other big will likely be Brandon Clark, you know, down the stretch of those games. It's – who do you take off? It's 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 tough. It's a great, you know, it's a great problem to have. A lot of teams wish they could have that problem, but but I'm with you, Sean. I think you give him his normal minutes in the first half. How he plays in the first half dictates how you use him in the second half. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, here's the biggest thing for me to Michael. The Grizzlies just need to trust what got him here. Ball yeah. movement, physical play inside and outside. They talked about being more physical as well. Dominating the paint on both ends. This is a better paint defensive team, an overall better paint producing team on offense as well. I know that Carl Anthony Towns certainly dominated getting to the rim, but listen, Malik Beasley and Anthony uh, Edwards were 9 of 11 on contested shots in game one. There is going to be at least a stretch, I feel, of a bit of regression for the Minnesota Timberwolves in this game. You know, we saw the shot quality charts and all this different stuff. The Grizzlies are going to have to take advantage that our regression happens and it's staying within themselves. One of the best quotes that came out before this series started was Taylor Jenkins saying, our biggest opponent in this series is us. I don't feel that was a slight towards the Minnesota Timberwolves. I feel that's the Grizzlies knowing who they are, knowing they're the more talented team. They're going to need to play like it. And the best way for them to do that is to trust the things that allow for them to be the best version of themselves and to implement that strategy moving forward. And even if for some reason it gets stopped or it doesn't work for a few plays, stick with it. Eventually it's going to pay dividends. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I couldn't say it no better to myself. Uh, they need to stick with their guns and they're going to they're gonna have to make some changes. You know, uh, the Timberwolves have a lot of film on them. There's no denying that, but um, they just have to stick to it. Like John Morant, he talked about being blitz a lot this season. He's seen that all year long. He knows the answer so he knows what he needs to do, and he's done that all season. Because him being blitzed isn't anything new, by the way, um, viewers. Like that is something he has experienced all season long, and we saw the type of season he had while dealing with that. So you got that uh, Desmond Bain, um, the way he plays, the way he shoots. You know, he shot three of eight on three pointers in that last game, and for some reason, you know, I thought he could have taken a couple more. 
you know, just going back and looking at some of the shots uh, that were passed up and things like that, it felt like he could have gotten a couple more uh, within the rhythm of the game. So we'll see, you know, what opportunities come for him. We'll see what opportunities come for Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr. Uh, it's it's going to be fun, but uh, I think the Grizzlies, you know, we see a lot of times when, when a home team goes down 1-0, that, that game too is really their chance to uh, put their foot on the gas and, and, and show you, hey, this is still our court. And this is still our series. And I think the Grizzlies are still the favorites. I still the, think the Grizzlies win in six, but they've got to be able to show. I'm not saying this is a must win. It definitely is a critical win for the Grizzlies to pick up. But without a doubt, this team is fully capable of doing it. They just simply need to play their style of basketball and trust making sure they'll get the right decisions. To Michael, it's been a lot of fun. I hope that you have a good night. I know that you've got a big day tomorrow. I will see you tomorrow at the FedEx Forum, but it's been a pleasure, sir. And hopefully the next time we'll be talking, which will be probably in about 24 hours, we'll be able to talk about a game two victory for the Grizzlies. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's gonna. This is this is gonna be a big game. We always call Game Three those swing games. So even after we talk about this game, that next game will become the most important thing right after that. So, uh, locked on Grizz fans, stay tuned. You know, me and me and Sean, we're gonna have you covered. Exactly, and hopefully we'll be swinging for the fences after a big performance in Game Two. For DeMichael Cole, you can find him at DeMichael C. All his great work at the Commercial Appeal. My name's Sean Coleman. Find me at Stats SAC. My work over at Grizzly Bear Blues. Always a pleasure being with you. Until next time, go Grizz. We'll talk to you again soon. Hopefully, after a big Game Two victory, we'll see you soon here on the Locked On Grizzlies podcast. <laughs>